<laughs> Welcome back to Leveraging Leadership, where we unpack the art of business leadership. I'm your host, Emily Sander, Chief of Staff turned Executive Leadership Coach. I work with people to help them step into effective leadership and realize their professional and personal goals. If you have known failure and success, if you have had good bosses and bad bosses, if you are a high achiever and want new ideas, and if you want the practical and tactical side of things, then you are in the right place. This show is all about finding your points of greatest influence and leveraging them to better serve those around you. Welcome back to Leveraging Leadership. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. That's a quote by Albert Einstein on compound interest. Most of us are familiar with the term compounding from finance. And we hear people talk about retirement accounts and 401ks. And we're like, oh yeah, compounding interest. So that's where your money multiplies at an accelerated rate. So for instance, if you put an investment of $500 in and you have a 10% interest rate, then by the end of year one, you have 550. And then if you do that again, at the end of year two, you earn interest on your interest from the previous year. And so you have 600, you have $605 at the end of year two. And then if that process continues, eventually your initial investment of 500 will be eclipsed by the amount of money you make in interest. So it, it accelerated that rate for you. The best definition, the most straightforward definition of compound interest is by Ben Franklin. And he said, your money makes money. And then that money makes more money. So that is compound interest. And I do remember this principle in my life when I was very young, first starting out in the workforce. And it was my first job with a 401k. And like there was this big deal, like we're getting a 401k plan. And so the first thing I did was call my mom and dad and was like, what is a 401k plan? And they explained it to me and they were like, put as much money as you can in this thing, da 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 da. And I remember the person who came to talk to us about our 401k plan, his name was Jared. He was super nice. And he gave the big presentation to the group. And then you could sign up for individual sessions with him afterward. And I remember in the group session, he was like, if you just put $200 in every month, da 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 da. And he lost me at that point because at that time, $200 was like part of my rent money. I was like, I'm not giving you $200. But in the individual session, we worked on my personal finances and my personal situation. And I remember him saying, Emily, can you contribute $50 a month? And I was like, $50? Okay. So like, I still have a roof over my head. I still have stuff to eat. I can't go out to eat as much as I want. And so I said, yes, I technically can. But like, what? Why, why would I do that? What will I get at the end of this thing? And so he plugged in a few numbers into his computer and he made this graph. And he said, look, I'm going to bet that you are going to continue getting promoted every few years throughout your career. Now, if you continue to contribute at the same percentage rate or more as $50 represents to your salary now, then here is the number over the entire course of your career that you will end up with. And the number I ended up with was a millionaire. And I was like, sign me up. You want 50 bucks? Here you go. You want 75? I could probably do that too. Like make that number happen. And so I remember that like, whoosh, like, okay, this thing is crazy. How do you take 50 bucks a month and make that number? Now, a lot of assumptions went into that, but the principle holds. And so I, I'm, I'm very thankful that he convinced me to do that. Okay, so that takes us to The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. It's a great book. It's one of my favorite books. It's on my top 10 book list for leaders. So if you're interested in this concept or how to apply it to your life, your team, your leadership, I would highly, highly recommend it. I'll have a link in the show notes. But basically, the one of the through lines or a theme that Darren Hardy uses over and over and over again in his book is small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equals radical difference. So one more time, small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equal radical difference. Now, the positive or negative radical difference is up to you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are this is the equation that he espouses over and over and over again that we should keep in mind. So the first part of that is small, smart choices. So he says, every little choice you make affects the trajectory of your life. 
which is like powerful and frightening in some ways. Like every little choice I make affects the trajectory of my life. Yeah, it does. And if you think about it, it is intuitive. It's kind of like the notion of I am creating the person I'm becoming right now. So right now, the choices I make are creating the person that I am tomorrow. I was like, oh yeah, like that kind of makes sense. We, we see it slowly over time, but over the course of the life, of course, all of our choices add up. So he said, small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equals radical difference. One of the best analogies or examples he gives in the book is if a plane was going from LA to New York City and it was only off by 1%, like 1% is like a tiny number, would that plane still reach its destination? Would it still hit New York City? So with that distance, which is across the country, 1% right or left would be 150 miles off. 150 miles, like right or left of your destination. So it would be like in Albany, New York, or in like Delaware somewhere. So that 1% makes a huge difference. Same principle applies to your life and your choices over time. He has this other cool graph in his book. And just think about a, a horizontal line, and that represents time. So the function of time, the passage of time. And then there's two other lines plotted on that, which are these small choices in the positive. So good choices, for lack of a better phrase. And then another line that represents bad choices or negative choices. And the interesting thing is for the like two thirds of the line of the of the midline that just represents time for like most of that, the positive and negative lines look the same. They're kind of like overlapping and they look like the same line. And then over a little bit of time, they start to separate a little bit, but there's a little bit blurry. Like, is that two lines? It still might be one big line. And then there comes this like distinct tipping point where the positive line shoots up, like almost parabolic, like shoots up straight up and the negative line drops off of a cliff. And there's no mistaking the difference between these choices that were made. So if you're sitting there going, look, like Emily, I'm doing all the right things. I'm investing in myself and I'm doing things right. And I have this person next to me who's making all the wrong choices, is selfish, is, you know, doing all these things. And I don't see a big difference. Like, you know, they're still getting the same things I'm getting career-wise, ahead-wise. Uh, I don't see a big difference. That's because you're in the beginning part of that line, of that sequence. There will come a point where it goes, bam, and like you go shooting up and someone else might go shooting down and the the outcome of your choices becomes more apparent. So that's all to say the small, smart choices and every little choice you make does add up. Okay, so now I want to talk through two examples. These aren't from the book, but they're certainly related to compounding. They are from the sports world. First one is around Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant said, look, I want to be the best basketball player in the world, period, full stop. And to be the best, I have to train and I have to practice a lot. And there's lots of other things that go into that. But essentially, I have to train and practice more than other people. And I also have to have quality training and quality practices and all those things. But for this example, I need to train more. And he talked about some people around the league who were out partying and who liked the fame and who liked, you know, the company of the fans and all the different things and the image and all of the all of those things that comes along with that environment. And he said, I know, I know for a fact they're not training very hard. Their schedule might be, look, I roll out of bed, I peel myself up, I go to the gym at 10, maybe I stay till 11 or 12. And athletes have to go and recover. So they go and recover, which is normal. But then they kind of, you know, kind of dilly dally around in the middle of the day. They kind of talk with friends and go to this thing over here and go to this photo shoot and do this fun thing. Maybe come back, maybe come back for like a 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. training session. And then they go out late at night, hit the clubs, sleep in and then do it all again. Instead, what Kobe does, he's at the gym at 4 a.m. and he works out till 6 he goes home, he recovers, he eats breakfast with his family, and then he's back training from 9 to 11. He takes a break, he recovers, he rests his body, and then he comes back from 2 to 4, he has dinner with his family, puts his kids to bed, and then he goes back for another training session from about 7 to 9. 
And Kobe said, look at how much more training that I have overall. Look at how much more training I have by getting up at 4 a.m. and training all day long. Now, interestingly, think about this. Let's say that one of his opponents sees how Kobe is training. And it's like, oh, let me, let me try that. Let me, let me try to catch Kobe. Let's say Kobe has been doing his training regimen for five years. And then people finally realize, oh my gosh, like this guy is pulling away from me. Let, let me try to be like him and try to train like him. There comes a point where they can no longer catch Kobe. No matter what they do, Kobe is so far ahead because all of this compounding training that they can't catch him. He is literally untouchable. Like, like, there's nothing they can do. That's the power of compounding. So that's what Kobe did in his career. And that's why he was one of the greatest players. Okay. Second example is Michael Phelps. So the Olympic uh, swimmer. Michael Phelps said, there was six years in my career where I trained every single day. I trained 365 days a year. And that put me 52 days ahead of my nearest competitor. So people who trained hard and were very dedicated to the sport usually took one day off. So let's say like Sunday, they took that day off. Well, then there's 52 of those days where Michael was training and they weren't. And he said in swimming, when you take a day off, it takes two to make up for that loss. And so instead of taking two steps back and having to make up for it, he was taking step forward, step forward, progress, progress. He was just going in a straight line up and to the right. And he said, this is what separated me. This is what separates good from great. His coach, Bob Bowman, has said he recognized early on that Michael was talented. First of all, he was like a physical freak. He was, had these weird proportions that were perfect for a swimmer. So like his arm length and his hand size and his torso to like lower body size, all this stuff is meant for swimming. And he said, I had Michael swim 50 miles a week when he was young. And what that was doing was building his lung capacity and heart capacity. And you couldn't do that by the time you had matured. So when Michael was like young, young, prepubescent, Bob Bowman was having him do this rigorous training to build that capacity into his body. Later on down the line, Michael compounded this even further and decided to sleep in this chamber that he had around his bed that simulated high elevation. And so the amount of oxygen in the air or around his bed was lower. And what he was training his body to do was to operate on lower oxygen levels. So over time, breathing less oxygen became normal for him and his body was used to that. And so when you jumped in a pool and you were swimming with your competitors, the oxygen debt affected him less. So everyone has less oxygen in a pool, but it affected him less adversely because of his training and because of the compounding choices he made. Now, is this an extreme example of compounding and extreme training? Yes, of course it is. We don't all do this. But let me ask you this. Who holds the world record for Olympic gold medals? That would be Michael Phelps. Okay, takeaways for you. First takeaway, set a goal or a destination and be as specific as you can. So if you're trying to go to New York City and you can zero in on those coordinates, that's best. If you're sitting there going, Emily, like I don't really have a specific destination, a general direction is good too. So generally I'm going in this direction. Cool, that's great. If you're like, I don't even have a general direction. I just know I don't want that. I know I don't want that, so I'm gonna move away from that. That can be a good starting place as well. So just keep your eyes out for, all right, what data points am I getting that might indicate, oh, yep, that's confirming this general direction is correct. And actually, I'm kind of narrowing my scope as I go along and get more experience or talk to more people or just now that I'm intentionally looking for these things, I'm able to narrow it down and be more specific over time. So set your goal because it can tell you, all right, are my choices moving me closer to that goal or further away? So that's step one. Takeaway two would be track your choices over a week. So that can be like a literal journal or something you track in, or it can be mentally like walk through your typical week. How are you spending time? Where is your mental energy going? Like what types of things are you doing? And you can look for things like, all right, am I spending a whole bunch of time um, watching Netflix? And maybe like I just wanted to watch a half an hour episode of an old sitcom I used to like. It's 30 minutes, no big deal. And whoopsie daisies, now I did three, four, five, six. And you, maybe you convince yourself, hey, it's only 22 minutes without commercials, da, 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 da. It's not that long, but you're sitting there for a big chunk of time. It could be, oh, I'm just going to check social media for just a second. No problem. 
And it could be like five minutes here, seven minutes there, 15 minutes there, five minutes while I'm waiting for something. Okay, yeah, I did like a 75 minute scroll that one time, but over a week, how much death scrolling are you doing or doom scrolling are you doing? It could be things like, how much time are you spending worrying about things that you cannot control? How much time are you spending doing that? How much time are you spending ruminating over things that have already happened? That's one of my favorite pastimes that I'm trying to get out of. How much time are you doing something that you hate? Maybe there's things that it's time to delegate those or it's time to automate or streamline or just get rid of them. So are you doing things where it's like, this is just painful? So take inventory. Keep track of your choices for a week or even a day if you can't do a week. Then determine if those choices are taking you closer or further away and at what rate. So like calculate that. So meaning take a Netflix example. If you spend two hours a day watching Netflix for like, let's say five days a week, not every day, because on the weekends you go out with friends or whatever. So two hours a day, five days a week, you get home from work, you're done. You want to zone out on binge on reality TV, whatever it is. So two hours a day, five days a week, that's 10 hours a week. Then take that over the course of a year. So 52 weeks, so that's 520. So how many days is that? Like 500, 520, 24 how many days of your life is that? It's like 21 or 22 days. That's like a working month. That's like a month of your time. So let me ask you this. Could you have done something else more beneficial in that month? A month is a long time. You can, like, you can do a lot in a month. So think about it that way. So calculate how you're spending your time. Calculate your choices and think about it there. Because sometimes it's like, look, it's it's 20 minutes, it's 10 minutes, it's five minutes here. It's not that big a deal. But if you really look at it, it might be, might be a different answer. It might be a different choice for how you spend your time. By the way, it's not always bad to watch Netflix. Sometimes that is the correct answer to watch Netflix for two hours or even for a full weekend. Sometimes that is what your body needs and what your mind needs. But just, just take my point as it's intended, which is take a look at the choices that you're making ongoing because they are determining who you are becoming. All right. So if you're sitting there going, look, Emily, I am bought into compounding. I am all over this thing. Uh, where do I start? Or I have some ideas like, no, I think I have a general direction and I have some ideas about how to compound this, but I really want to optimize this and get an action plan together. Can we talk about that? I would be more than happy to have a brainstorming session with you. You can check out the link for the free 30 minute clarity call in the show notes. As always, this is just for me to make sure that you're in a better spot when you lead that call than when you got in there. These are fun calls, these clarity calls with people, especially if they were off a specific episode. They're like, all right, I know what you're talking about in this sense, and here's my situation, and let's jam on this. And so these can be fun calls, nothing more than for me to add value to you. But if that's interesting, then check out the link in the show notes. Otherwise, go forward, make good choices, make sure compounding is working in your favor, and May the odds ever be in your favor. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Love you.